So I actually have two questions. So the first one, um, because the, the feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendency is happening so quick, um, by the time we notice the tension and tightness, is it more likely that by that time we're already at the habitual tendency? Like by the time we actually notice our, um, you know, there's some kind of tension in the head or, or in the body that right. we're actually at habitual tendency already. If you're using the practice all the time, if you're working in an office and you're using it all the time, it's gonna, you're, it's going to be that your mindfulness is getting sharper and sharper, and it's gonna seem like those things are happening slower. They're not really happening slower, but you will feel, you will see what happens with the feeling. You will catch the I, the craving, I like it or I don't like it, or you could catch it. These are the graduated thing levels that we go through in, in our practice. You know how our practice is progressive, you know, and how it progresses in steps when we do it with a spiritual friend and then we use more friends, okay? And then we don't ever do that again with our self in our practice or unless we need it personally after outside of the training, but we don't use it as a start for our meditation anymore. There's a big misunderstanding on that right now. People think, well, I have to go and start from the very beginning again no, each time. No, 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 no. We're trying to rewrite material now to try to get this across. You don't go back and send it to yourself again and then to a spiritual friend and then go to the other people again. Once you've gotten as far as the other people, it's like they shut the door and lock it and you don't go back there anymore in your training. From that point of being with the directions, you always start with the directions to go forward. As you're developing this way, if you're practicing at home and you're still keeping this up, okay, gradually um, we talk about hindrances in our practice. Uh, do you remember the sketch I showed you where you're here looking at the object of meditation and I told you that there's various levels of going over to here to this hindrance. You might catch it just as you're beginning to move or when it's on the way over there or when it's all the way over to it or when you're involved with it for a minute, say, or something. Oh, I'm not on my object anymore. These are different degrees of awareness, different degrees of sharpness of your meditation object. Now take that and apply that principle to the feeling comes up and the first time you usually won't catch it at painful feeling, but you will catch, be able to catch it if you are sharpening your mindfulness at I like or I dislike. And then you will feel internally the running of clinging because of the mental proliferation. And you have, how do I know this is happening? How do I know where this is happening? I told you guys to get a notebook. I say it all the time. You need this little tiny notebook in your pocket. And when this happens with somebody afterwards, go have a cup of tea and just go over what just happened and say, when did I see that? Okay, I have to sharpen up my awareness and it takes more practice is what it is. More practice with your mindfulness getting sharper and your interest in watching what your mind is doing, noticing what your mind is doing in a situation all the time when you're working. Does it make sense? So that, that, that example, it, it's the same sort of thing with this as it was uh, with the other thing in, in the practice, the same thing where you move away over here to the, to the thing and people will say, well, it happened so fast, I never know. No, 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 no. You have to understand, first of all, I mean, I think that's, they gave up and said, it happened so fast, I move over to the hindrance. That hindrance is causing me a lot of problems. That hindrance is guilty. That hindrance should go to jail. He should have the electric chair. <laughs> And I'm maintaining now, I'm getting, preparing a legal uh, procedure to go to court and prove once and for all that the hindrance is innocent. The hindrance is 
innocent. It's us that is changing, not the hindrance. It's us that is lowering our interest on our object of meditation. Our energy is dropping down our, um, our let's see, our interest and, and, and our energy and the level of collectedness in our mind and our observation power. And as soon as you're slipping, your energy goes down and your interest goes down, you leave a hole and out pops what? Human curiosity. Hello, I'm right here, just waiting. <laughs> and pulling you over to the hindrance to find out what it is. But it, remember, you have knowledge and why are we protecting you? Because if you keep repeating that knowledge and what is the law of the hindrance? Do you remember the law when we did the meditation laws? The hindrance has nothing, no information whatsoever. The only, the only use that you have from the hindrance, no matter what it is during the meditation practice session, the only thing is it's teaching you how craving works. And if the hindrance, you feel the hindrance there, then watch what happens with the craving. It's like a signal. There's a, a hindrance or an obstruction. And remember what we said about objects and obstructions, right? Obstacles and obstructions in 22 in section 10. And he says perfectly clearly, do not ever uh, engage a hindrance. That's what he's saying. Do not engage. He's telling you straight out in a sentence, any obstacle that arises cannot become an obstruction for you unless you personally engage it. So he's telling you what? He's telling you what the hindrance eats. <laughs> he's telling you what the food is for the hindrance. So do I have to struggle to end my fight with the hindrances? No, you need a good lesson on how a hindrance operates and you need to know what it eats. And then you take away the food and that's the end. And there is no confrontation or big battle or extended thing for months and months or anything else. But unless the person is told point blank what the nutriment is for a hindrance, they're going to fight with it. They're going to fight. And when they're doing that, then what's happening? Ah, it's, it's Atta. Here I am, Atta. <laughs> and she put a little face on my finger, you know. Atta is here. Atta is absolutely here. <laughs> you know, and you, you, you know, we're not taking away your Atta. That's good because don't you touch my Mapo cereal. It's mine. <laughs> we used to have a commercial. I want my Mapo. And they sold, tried to sell us Mapo cereal when we were little. I can't remember what it was. I think it was oat or wheat cereal. And they had this little kid and he had a big brother and he kept, every time the little kid at the, the high chair turned away like this, the other kid ate some of his Mapo cereal and the little kid was screaming by the end of the ad, don't, I want my Mapo. <laughs> And don't touch my Mapo. Well, don't touch the hindrance. Don't touch it. Don't touch it at all. Leave it alone. So we have to train ourselves. These are pieces of knowledge that have been kept away from the teaching for a very long time. So it's not, it's not, um, it's not, I'm not suggesting to you that if you want to be well loved, for instance, in Australia, that you go to where there's a mess of people and they're all practicing and you just walk in there and say, you know, I, I don't ever concern myself with hindrances. It's a good way to be hated. <laughs> you should. You need to destroy them, annihilate them, eradicate them, suffocate them, suppress them, and subdue them. And if you don't, you will never proceed. The problem is you could say, but I don't want to proceed. I would like to watch proceedings happen without me going forward, you see. That's another way to go have your own ice cream and stay alone. <laughs> 
But that's the, that is, that is the fact, because they're going to send you back here. They're going to send you back here and they're going to tell you, you know, that this and, you know, I actually had someone very important once tell me that, well, you know, sometimes you do have to do this. He said, and I said, yes, but it's not normal. And you'll notice that it is the seventh part of the sutta, okay? The seventh of seven things you can do. This is the last one. But if while giving attention to stilling the thought formation, see, and that's just it, stilling the for formation. You're, this is all about how you should be stilling a mind formation that comes up in your brain. But nowhere else in the teaching does it tell you to do this except this one place. And it's pretty hardcore, I'll tell you. There, if, they, if, it, if the thought still arises in him as evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion, then, then here's what you should do. With your teeth clenched like this, okay? Teeth clenched shut, okay? And your tongue pressed against the roof of your mouth. Go ahead. <laughs> That's how you're supposed to be. He should beat down, constrain, and crush mind with mind. The problem with the sutta, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is there's 150 other suttas in this book. And uh, this, this little sutta is on three pages and there's nowhere in the whole entire book that it says that this is correct and gives another thing to back it up and say, yeah, do it that way. It's not here in the whole book. But if we take what else he's saying, I think, you pro I, think I figured it out. I think there's 32 or 40 suttas that tell you that the key to this whole thing is abandonment. Even when you go to the Sabasava Sutta number two, if you look at that, um, it's talking about it one way, but listen carefully. The, the, the taints, when we talk about the taints, uh, they should be abandoned. So listen carefully, because no matter what I say to you, remember the key word here is abandoned. Abandoned by seeing them, abandoned by restraining them, abandoned by using them, abandoned by enduring them, abandoned by avoiding, and abandoned by removing, and abandoned by developing. Now, we have to go step by step to explain how it really does mean get out of the way, leave it alone, just go home, turn around and watch. <laughs> we, have to, we have to show you step by step, but when you see it, that means let it go, relax, smile and come back. And whenever you, there should be abandoned by restraining. Well, restraining, you can't personally restrain a hindrance. You see, you cannot do it. So what does it mean? Well, restraining it, how? Well, if you don't know right effort, you would go back to let's grab it by the throat and just choke it to death, okay? <laughs> you know, but if you did know what you were told in Samyutta Nikaya and what we're teaching you, you would know this means you restrain it by the proper steps of performing right effort. So that's restraining it. Isn't it restraining it if I do it with right effort? Okay, so there you go. Abandoned by using it, you use it to learn how it operates and how you can remove it. You endure it by just allowing it to arise and, and exist and pass away because you understand a Nietzsche. You see what I'm doing though is telling you things that is based on the knowledge of how things actually work and testing it a lot and, and seeing what I'm saying. That's how you endure it, by avoiding it. Well, by avoiding it simply means don't move over to it. You understand the law of the, the hindrance and the law is do not ever engage it. So to avoid it means follow the Buddha's advice and do not engage. Isn't that avoiding it? Okay, by removing it, Removing it is pretty simple because you simply keep going and it will fade away because of a Nietzsche. So there isn't an actual, like, uh, you know, garbage pickup system for hindrances <laughs> where we have to call the truck and come and get somebody to scoop it up and remove it. 
all you have to do is replace it and it is removed. Is that true? Right. It's true, right? Okay. And then to develop it, to what they say about development, we haven't gotten that for you, but to develop it, reflecting wisely develops mindfulness enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and creation cessation and the ripening in, in relinquishment he develops okay so he's talking about using the seven factors of enlightenment in order to develop it well what i would suggest to anyone who wants to sort that out is to go to samyutta nikaya bojanga samyutta on page number 1597 and read the discussion closely about careless attention to a hindrance, okay? Read it very carefully, because if you spend any time paying attention to a hindrance, you will prevent the seven enlightenment factors from arising. That's what that discussion is about. It has a very perfunctory, very precise title. <laughs> the nourishment and denourishment of a hindrance in direct relationship to the arising or the non-arising of the enlightenment factors. Great title. <laughs> Not short, kind of like me, I guess. <laughs> Not short. But but that, that information is right there. So there shouldn't be a lot of strife about this. And, and turning it into something that is related to this day and time for the definition of the words in, in the Sabasava is a dangerous thing to do. So this is abandoned by seeing. The point is we're looking for abandonment. We are not looking for, we don't hear this being translated, destroying it by seeing it, destroying it by restraining it. We don't see that, do we? We don't see that. We see abandoned by seeing, abandoned by restraining, abandoned by using, abandoned by enduring, abandoned by avoiding, abandoned by removing, and abandoned by developing. But we always see abandoned. Now, how much effort is there in abandonment, we had this is like asking me, Sister Kama, how do you do the release step? How do you do that? Okay. And you see this? You see, oh, you can't see it. That's funny because it's green like the green screen. That's hysterical. Okay, let's try again. We have <laughs> we have another one here. We have lots of these. Okay. How do I let go of this? How do I let go of it? I have it and I have it. It's happening. To, it's happening now. How do I release it? It's really space math and it's really like quantum physics and in and, and real high level science. Are you ready? Release. That's it. And this was my attention. Let go. But the key piece the Buddha taught us in the, by emphasizing right effort as a practice, he told us we cannot th that you can release something, but you cannot progress unless you replace it. Because if I had simply let go of that and just come back again, let go, come back again, and not relax, I would still have tension, still have tightness, still have concern and worry about this coming back again and again and again. If you really want to understand, go and find one of the boards that are on the internet about um, that there's some people that are trying really hard personally, really, really hard. I'm not making fun of it, okay? It's very painful to watch this though, to try that hard without knowledge. It is almost as, um, almost as, as um, them doing that without knowledge of how the hindrance operates is sad to watch the suffering that goes on and what i'm saying is if you go there and you read these boards these people are really suffering and they don't know that 
they're supposed to personally get out of the way. They think they are going to make themselves accomplish Nibbana. And that is the surest way not to accomplish reaching that, you know, experience by to try to do it. So it's, it's important for the person to understand how much the Buddha was trying to let us know again and again all over the place to abandon it, abandon it, abandon it. You see, if we go to the Upak Kalesa Sutta, if this 128, if we go up to 128, how, what does it say in the summary, in the summary of it, the last summary of it, the last uh, page, it does the same thing, doesn't it? And that's a kind of neat thing because it says the moment I understood that doubt is an imperfection of the mind, I abandoned doubt. See? An imperfection of the mind. When I understood inattention is an imperfection of the mind and had abandoned inattention. He's telling them what he did with all these, these types of hindrances, troubles that came to him in his practice. When uh, sloth and torpor, uh, uh, when I, I realized that it was a uh, an imperfection of mind, I abandoned it. Then I abandoned fear, and then it goes through the summary. Abandoned fear, abandoned elation, abandoned inertia, abandoned excess of energy, abandoned deficiency of energy, abandoned longing, abandoned diversity, abandoned meditation upon forms, and abandoned um, uh, I have uh, the I have abandoned the imp uh, all those imperfections of mind, and let me now develop my concentration in the proper way, productive way, productive way. Okay, in the proper way is productive. And what is productive according to the Buddha? What is progressive or productive to the Buddha was always concerning path being able to go down the path or not being able to go down the path. That's when the imperfection, the imperfection is if you can't go down the path. So if we look at it that way, that's right in, in the suttas saying it to us again and again. So we don't, we don't want to, um, you don't want to go back to those other words. <laughs> we want to have, uh, release them, uh, let them go let them be, allow them to just be there and without concern. We want to practice non-concern. One time there was a man and he said, well, you Buddhists really are saying, uh, go onto an island, stay on an island unto yourself. So maybe I should just get a boat and go to an island. And I went like this. I went, the thing about that is if you go to the island in the boat without the instructions, <laughs> you're going to have a big problem. <laughs> You know, and that, that evidence is still here, isn't it? When someone is struggling relentlessly with hindrances, it's basically because there was no class on what a hindrance is, how it operates, what it eats, and how it gets food. Um, coming back to that hindrance, um, is it possible that um, as we are do, using the 6R to abandon the hindrance, when we are watching how um, the craving arises towards that hindrance, when we release it, another underlying hindrance comes up. So for example... Oh, sure. What you're uh, talking about, what you're talking about is how fast does dependent origination operate in your mind, in your brain? Hmm. there's a hundred thousand circles like that so when we're talking about dependent origination to talk about dependent origination um we we have to remember it's impossible for us to draw it <laughs> here's dependent origination okay and some people say well this is the cycle of cognition but when you're talking about you're you're watching one event we're asking you you couldn't possibly we're set, telling you first you couldn't possibly watch this at the speed it is happening in the brain because that would look like kind of like this okay
it's happening like that. And it's just continually happening in your brain. Okay. So trying to watch it this way, we know it's impossible. The other way they want to talk about it, they used to want to talk about it across three lifetimes. But I think that anybody with any sanity today really does sort of consider that what uh, Buddha Dasa spent his whole life trying to tell the world, Venerable Buddha Dasa was trying to point out that that is not Buddhism. That's talking about e eternalism, to talk about how this happens, and it happens over three lifetimes, you see? So, you know, they're talking about how the cycle happens and trying to make it say it's describing three lifetimes. But that's not going to help your relationships in this life either. This is macro, okay? Macro, cosmic, um, dependent origination. This is microcosmic, um, microcosmic, uh, dependent origination. Um, and this is not something I'm coming up with. There are many people who do discuss this in the Buddhist world, okay? And what I'm telling you to look at, let, there's a middle way. And when I realized there was a middle way of teaching a person, how does anger happen? How does dependent origination happen? How does um, hate, love, all the different emotions, how do they actually operate? And the way to look at it is to study the 12 pieces Okay, but what you have to keep in the back of your mind is this is existing and this is happening. Okay, so when you're looking at this, just try to look at it one event at a time. Don't stress yourself out. And if something else is coming up, it's just that you don't, you maybe not able to, to um, concentrate on one event as it's going on because the other one is chasing after it. Do you see what I mean? You have to tone your mind down, sharpen up your awareness, and you also have to sharpen up your equanimity of just watching this and saying, okay, I'm only going to look at this one event that happened in the office today when I go home, okay? I'm going to sit there tonight and I'm going to look at what happened in relationship to this with just the dependent origination, And I'm going to see what happened with my chart, which is only seven of these links, right? And you look at your work chart and see how did it happen? What was I taking personally? And you say, what could have happened if I turn the page and write that event? Where could I have been impersonally dealing with this? And always remember, too, if you're trying to work out a situation where there's something happening between two people, that both people, they do not need dependent origination, you know, in this whole thing, you know. They do not both need to know about dependent origination. Only one needs to know. The other one doesn't know. But you can still change the entire situation because one side of the equation in the incident, in the situation, changes because you know. That's where when she came down to the bottom of the stairs and looked into the living room, that's where she separated herself and had the experience for the first time of watching a movie, watching a movie in front of you instead of taking it immediately personally, fast from habit. You take it personally and start putting yourself down. It must be my fault. I'm to blame. I made a mistake. Everything's blown because of me, 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 me. Let it all go. <laughs> Let it all go, sister. <laughs> Just try it without doing that, okay? <laughs> you know, is that thing about keep it simple, um, keep it simple, son, and keep it simple, sister. <laughs> keep it simple. Remember the seven links, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? You contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendency, and the birth of reaction, okay? And then what happens after that? Keep it simple. Okay, and then when you're finished with that one, bring up another one. If you want to look at the second one, look at the second one the same way and see what happens with the seven and keep explaining it to your brain like a child. And pretty soon your brain learns, your, your, your brain learns that that's what you want to do. And you just want to break this down and see it. The internal part of it is just impersonal. It's all impersonal, you know, it's all impersonal. The, and, you know, when we grow up, 
we lose the capability of what children are doing in nursery school where they run to one object and say, oh, look, that's a Buddha. Oh, look, there's a, there's a rabbit right there. <gasps> look at that's a leaf. Oh, I never saw that flower. And each thing I just mentioned, they left it behind. <coughs> they left it behind. And their minds are able to go and then and then and then like that to to one thing like that and like that and like that and like that and up here and up here and oh look there's a big nun right in front of us <laughs> you see <laughs> so we we have to practice to get that back to some extent so that we're just looking at one thing at a time and pretty soon the brain will do the rest the brain will do the rest okay the big thing people is basically uh, when you're with us and you're practicing and you're learning this, uh, you will get to a place where you'll come in and Bhante would be sitting there and he might say to you, you have to get out of the way. Just get out of the way because you keep saying this and saying that about me, 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 me. When you're talking to me, you need to let that just go completely. And then just sit and be very quiet and just watch, you see? And when somebody's having doubt, for instance, or when they finish a retreat and they go away and then they say, I'm so worried, I'm going to have uh, this doubt come up again. They, as if, <laughs> you know, this doubt came up before. They're not seeing that doubt is actually a hindrance. And doubt's a hindrance. It's listed all over the place in the text as a hindrance, okay? So it needs to be treated exactly as a hindrance. When that doubt shoots its head up after a section of training, you should be told immediately by the guide or the teacher should be saying immediately to the student, you put that down, you just let that go. You laugh at doubt and you saw it, you see it as an imperfection, you abandon it and let it be. When you abandon something, you don't pay attention to it anymore. If it pushes up, then you laugh at it. You think you're cute. You're going to come up again. Okay, come up again. Go ahead. I'm going to just laugh at you and keep going. And I'm not going to pay attention to you until it finally understands you are not going to feed the hindrance anymore. Because every time you put careless attention on that hindrance and doubt is a hindrance, you are feeding it and making it happen. What did it say in 19 that we all learned? What you think and ponder on becomes the inclination of your mind, right? It's in 20 or it's in 19. I can't remember. I think it's in 20. I think it's in 19. No, it's in 19. Yep. Um, what you frequently think and ponder upon, that is what becomes the inclination of your mind. Whatever a monk frequently thinks and ponders on, that will become the inclination of his mind. Section 6, 19. 19, section 6. Okay? These are the ones that you, you sew cross stitches and you do embroidery and you put them on the wall and you've got them all over the house and you're trying to drown yourself. I had them on the ceiling and over my bed and I had them on the wall when I sat up to get up and I had them in the bathroom and I had them in, above the where I was brushing my teeth right in front of me before I went out of where I was in this tiny little cootie in the forest. I had them all over the place and I was trying to drown myself because how did they tell us the mind learns? Remember the word? It begins with an R. Repetition. That's how the brain learns a new habitual tendency and lets go of the old one. And how does it work in your brain? It works through neural pathways. And those neural pathways that pushed you into thinking about doubt, they were like this big, but your new one is only maybe this big. So you have to keep doing this one and this one will just sort of dry out and curl up and just die. It'll disappear. That's how it works. The older you are, it takes a little longer for us to do it. 
but it's through understanding that the brain works through repetition. That's what the neural cognitive science is saying. And that's how we retrain our brain. Okay.